Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Hall. I am the director of data at Goat. Um, Goat is the world's largest marketplace for buying and selling authentic sneakers. Um, we started in 2015, and really we wanted to solve the problem of counterfeit sneakers being sold online. Um, the main motivation for the company comes from one of our co-founders. Um, uh, his name's Dyson, and uh, he had a pair of sneakers as, as a kid. Uh, they were some Jordan 5 briefs, and he absolutely loved these sneakers. They were his, his most important possession, right? And so fast forward like two decades later, and uh, Nike re-releases the Jordan 5 grapes, and he, he decided he had to absolutely have them. And so he went on what was the, the biggest marketplace for sneakers at the time, eBay, and uh, you know, scoured, found lots, of, lots and lots of pages worth of these sneakers, um, and tried to find the right size, and tried to figure out which ones were real, and ended up purchasing one. And uh, you know, they shipped it to him, he opens up the box, gets real excited, and lo and behold, they're fake. And so he could not figure out why there wasn't already a solution online to figure this out, right? And so counterfeit product actually remains the biggest problem today in um, sneaker resale. Nike officially is now the most counterfeited brand in the world. And one in 10 shoes sold online is fake. Um, so up here we have uh, just a search for a very popular sneaker. It's the, the Yeezy 350 Belugas. And um, you know, to the untrained eye, you, you can't really determine what's real and what's fake here, but we had our authenticators, these are domain experts who know these sneakers inside and out, um, go through and actually 40% of the ones on this page are fake. And actually if you look at the center left image there, there's someone kind of attaching our card that we ship along with authentic product on eBay trying to guarantee that shoe's authenticity. Um, and so, like I said, GOAT launched in 2015, and we really wanted to solve the issue of counterfeit sneakers online and really bring trust and safety to an industry that really needed it. And so we have a team of dozens of, of manual authenticators. Like I said, these guys know, you know 30 years worth of Jordans, front and back. They know what they look like. They know what the stitching looks like. They, they know how they smell. Um, and, and so they're able to really tell whether these are, are real and fake, and that's kind of the manual process. Um, let's see here. Um, and so we pioneered a model that we like to call the ship to verify model. And so how that works is, is the seller lists the product with us, right? And um, then the buyer you know, scours the site, finds the shoes that they want, and once they agree to purchase it for a specific price, um, a deal is struck, and it's shipped to us. The, the seller ships us the shoes, and the buyer gives us the money. And we verify the shoes manually with these people in a warehouse. Um, and then uh, once we determine that it's authentic, we go ahead and ship the shoe off to the buyer and pay off the seller. Pretty simple model, right? And this allows us to provide a very uh, retail-like experience for the buyers while providing liquidity to the sellers um, to, to be able to sell their product. And uh, like I said, every single sneaker is inspected and authenticated using both that manual method and then also uh, machine learning models. Uh, since 2015, we've grown the company a lot. Uh, it's now the largest sneaker marketplace in the world. And uh, we have 600 employees, over 600 employees. We have 12 million users, of which 150,000 are sellers. Um, this is really a lucrative business. In, in 2017, our, our very top tier sellers each individually sold more than $2 million worth of product on the, on the site. Um, and in 2018, that same group sold over $10 million worth of product. So this is getting to be big business. We have over 800,000 shoes for sale on our platform uh, in 40,000 different SKUs. And so I'm going to run through a couple examples here. The first is kind of the architecture diagram of a system we built out for our data scientists to really be able to iterate quickly on the models that they, they want to build, right? Because we, we're a marketplace. We have a lot of kind of classic marketplace problems. But um, these are problems that normally would be solved by um, hiring up manual teams to do manual review. And what we found is through uh, being able to allow our data scientists to iterate quickly, we can actually um, really allow our job, like amplify the ability of our manual teams to do their job more effectively. Um, so before I jump into kind of the, the workflow itself, I'm going to go over uh, just a couple things that always come up in Q&As so that we can kind of knock those out of the way. Uh, the first one is, is, you can see that main box there is, is in EKS. Um, we were originally in ECS, uh, but once EKS was announced, it actually gave us some of the benefits that we had been looking for. 
Um, the first was local development on, on our um, uh, laptops themselves, right? So that we can easily iterate as we're developing the platform itself. Uh, it had a massive open source community around Kubernetes. And so it was really easy to, to kind of find answers to questions that we had. Um, at the time, uh, the GPU support was better. Um, and then uh, it was just really easy to deploy. Um, the other big one is why did we use EFS? Um, EFS has been clutch for us to be able to uh, mount drives as, as kind of network drives, or cloud storage as network drives, on the, the machines that we're running our experiments on. Um, so that really allows us to kind of uh, spin up and shut down sessions for our data scientists, and they can and, and offload all of the assets and notebooks to EFS so that we can, they can start up like right where they left off. Um, lastly, this is a mixed compute cluster. Right? So we have both GPU and CPUs inside of here. And what that, that gives us is, um, uh, we can, since we use the same uh, cluster for both training and running experiments, as well as the endpoints that host them, anytime there's an endpoint that's not getting immediately hit uh, with a lot of traffic, we can actually grab that compute time and use it for, for experiments. Right? Um, and also, since we actually, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> The notes are not up here. Let me grab my cards. Um, also, since we actually standardized our instances across what we use our entire, on our entire platform, uh, we're actually to use, able to use the reserved instances that, that save us money. And so let's start at the bottom here. We all know that the, the uh, kind of entry place for a data scientist is a Jupyter notebook. So we built a little CLI that allows us to request a notebook on demand. And what it does is it spins up an instance of, of JupyterLab inside of the, in the EKS cluster. Um, and, and that can host one or many notebooks. And it, uh, we can also specify the, any memory and compute needs that we need at the time. So you can get a CPU box, you can get a GPU. Um, and so a data scientist can do any explanatory, uh, exploratory work that they need there, as well as any like, real initial model training. Um, and like I said earlier, like any notebooks or artifacts, if they need to shut down the session, are offloaded to EFS. And so uh, once they're done with that initial kind of exploratory work or, or modeling, they're able to uh, define a, an experiment. And what they do is they define just a single run method. Uh, and, and then w that does all of the training and testing inside of it. Uh, and, and they're able to then create an experiment. Um, and the output of that is just a model and then metrics associated with that model. Um, and that can be any kind of model that's, that's defined inside of the platform. Uh, and so the metrics then and the model themselves are offloaded to S3 and ready to be picked up by an endpoint. Uh, as a little side note, uh, the endpoints, or sorry, the, the run method that generates the model and the metrics themselves can be put on a e, uh, Kubernetes cron job so that you can do it for regular training like you know, every day, every hour, whenever you need to retrain your model. Um, so that brings us to the endpoints. Um, the endpoints are really simple. They're just Python Flask apps. And uh, they're single route uh, apps. Uh, you define a single method, a single route that just takes in parameters or an ID or a key that allows you to kind of look up those parameters inside of a production database. Um, and then it can feed those into the model that's taken out of S3. And then uh, basically returns the prediction either in single or batch predictions, whatever the data scientist defines. Um, and then a quick note on the front proxy here. The front proxy is just a bunch of Envoy instances that pass traffic through. Um, and then also, it does service discovery for us. So anytime you spin up a new endpoint, uh, the endpoint is a Kubernetes service that just registers itself uh, as a service uh, as a, like, with Envoy service discovery. So uh, that's the overall. Obviously, there's an EOB in front of it, and that's kind of self-explanatory. But that's, that's the basic flow for the data scientists. So now that you know a little bit about the architecture, I wanted to share an example of, of just a small problem that we're solving that, like I said, this is kind of a classic marketplace problem um, and one that normally takes a lot of manual verification, but that doesn't scale well. And so um, we use ML across the company and even small problems to try to, to solve this. And um, so this example is, it really comes into play when there's sellers whose goals don't align with ours, right? they'll list product that they actually don't have on hand. On release day, there is you know, a very high premium for these shoes. 
And so they'll list them, and then if someone agrees to buy them at that price, they'll scramble and go try to find these shoes. And what that leads to is a lot of seller cancellations, which leads to a bad user experience, right? Um, and so we have a, a series of three machine learning models that we use to try to solve this problem, to try to determine whether the person has the shoes on hand or not. Um, the first one you've heard of, hot dog, not hot dog, right? Uh, we decided this one is shoe, not shoe, right? And the point of this is every time a seller makes a listing, we require them to upload photos. Um, here you see on the left kind of like the ideal listing. It looks like you have the lateral side of the shoe, the inside of the shoe tag, and then, and then the box, right? And on the right you have, I don't even know what that is, just a bunch of colors. Um, and so it's kind of a tough problem due to uh, variance in the negative class, right? People upload screenshots from their phone. They upload naked photos of their feet. Uh, they upload, uh, the, I think, what is maybe the inside of someone's pocket and maybe their finger covering the camera lens. I don't, I don't really know what it is. Um, and so, so there's a broad uh, set of photos that can be in that class. Um, also, uh, we needed to label it, right? Um, the, uh, they, don't, they don't give us, obviously, they're trying to fool the system, so they don't give us the label when they first upload it, whether there's a shoe or not in the photo, right? So we actually had to do our own labeling with a third-party service, but moving forward, we're actually using SageMaker Ground Truth to do it um, now that that's released. Um, so this is just a, a pre-trained ResNet on ImageNet, uh, fine-tuned with the data set that we labeled ourselves. Um, and actually, let's see if this works. Yeah, so you can actually see our model that we affectionately call Dachshund. Um, is, has determined that there's actually no shoe in, this, in, in these sets of pictures. So now we know that there is a shoe in the photo, right? But is it the right shoe? The next model is, is trying to determine out of our 40,000 SKUs, is it the right one? Is it the one that they said that they're listing? Um, and so this is a multitask classifier, right? And not only is it trying to determine the SKU, but it's also trying to determine the silhouette, the designer, the brand, a lot of different pieces of information that we feed it. Again, pre-trained ResNet model and ImageNet, really easy to iterate on our platform as you're trying to develop these models. Um, and it was fine-tuned after like, the kind of initial, like the, the out-of-the-box ImageNet model um, on our data set of photos that are uploaded um, by both buyers and sellers when they upload for a specific SKU. Um, and so as you can see there, like, you know, we have one very confident ranking there, and then some others that aren't as confident. Um, and they're actually pretty close, because there's a lot of versions of shattered backboards, and it determined that it was the first shattered backboards that came out. Um, and then, so now we know that we have a shoe in the photos, and we know that it's the right shoe, hopefully, right? Uh, but do they actually have the shoes in hand? And this is kind of the, the trickier piece, right? And this is one that we honestly have not fully solved yet. But we have a good idea. And so there's two specific cases that we can think of here. Um, and, and the way that we decided to solve it is, have we seen this photo before, right? If you see an example on the left there, that's where a user actually uploaded photos directly from Nike.com. And so we've seen a lot of photos from Nike.com, so we can actually tell whether we've seen those before. And on the right here, you have um, the same photos for multiple listings from the same seller. So they may only have one pair of shoes on hand, but they're listing it five times to try to get the best possible price. And so um, we just use a simple like, image hashing model. We basically embed the image and then use uh, a distance metric to decide whether we've actually seen it before or not. And so with, with methods like these, in the last year alone, we've been able to prevent over $34 million worth of bad orders through our platform. And that's really improved user experience measurably and dramatically and, and provided a huge value in our scaling marketplace. And we're going to continue to invest in both the architecture and models like these moving forward as we scale globally. So thank you. <laughs>